push-ups and wake everybody up a little. So, everybody up? We're going to... No, I'm just kidding. Well, uh, this morning I want to... We're going to start to get into the book of Ezra. And we've, we've really closed out Second Chronicles, I feel like. And I want to begin to get into uh, everything that's happening in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. And I don't know how long we're going to spend here. Uh, my prayer is till the rapture, because I hope the rapture soon, and then it won't matter. But there's so much material in these three books that are so applied to where we are right now in, in history. And everything that is going on around the world, whether the world knows it or not, they're dealing within these three books. Now, I'm, I'm going to continue to dig around in here and, and try to glean as much out of these books that I can. Um, because there's a lot more in here than what I know that God has given me to this point. Now, whether I figure it all out or, or God gives me as much as I need, I don't know. But I'm going to keep working through it. And I've got a little bit of time because the, the real book that I've, I'm still trying to struggle with, how it all intricately fits into what's going on in the world right now, is Esther. And it's the last of the three. So i got a little more time. And, it, you know, this is one of those things where I'll, I'll mess with it for a while, and then my head just, I can't take anymore. And then i got to get away from it a while. And then I'll jump back in it, and I'll, so we'll see what happens. But Ezra and Nehemiah completely deals with the nation of Israel. It's everything to do with, with the Jews. Esther deals with the Gentiles. And and that's where the play comes in there. And and it's interesting. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share this just to begin the whole process. You know, everybody always asks, well, when's the, the third temple going to be built? Is it going to be built before the rapture, after the rapture? I don't know. But if God orchestrates things the way he did in Ezra and Nehemiah Esther, I would say the temple will not be built till after we are out of here. Now, whether they start, you know, they've already started the process, as I've mentioned several times in the past, because they, what, they're building it off site, and they're going to literally truck it in and um, build it. So, what they're doing, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, you, you know, these, these huge warehouse facilities that they're building, those warehouse facilities come in on trucks. They don't cast the concrete on site and build it all. They literally build these, I think they're like 50-some feet tall uh, sections of concrete that are, I don't know, 8 to 10 foot wide. And they build them all off-site. They cast them. They lay them on a flatbed truck, and the truck brings them on the site, and then the crane picks them up and stands them up, and then they weld them together. And that's how they do it. Well, that's how they're designing the third temple. You can actually get online, and you can take uh, 3D tours of the temple it's already designed they know how it's going to look they know i mean it's it's and they are actually mining um i, I probably have the the mineral wrong i want to say lime but i could be wrong but it's coming out of indiana a lot of it they're they're mining it out of indiana and wherever i don't know if if they've revealed where they're building it they might have i just don't remember but they're they're shipping that lime and that's a big part of uh what they're using to build this thing with. But if you look at the time frame, I think chronology in the Bible matters, and I think the order of the books in the Bible matter for different reasons. But if you look at the timeline of how this works, you've got 606 B.C. That is when Israel goes into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. That's that's the end of 2 Chronicles. That's, wh that's when Nebuchadnezzar comes in, takes them out. They're 70 years in captivity. <clears throat> so you got 70 years here. That's when they're in Babylon. This is when the book of Daniel is written. All the events that happen in Daniel take place during that 70-year time period. It's Israel in captivity. Now, the book of Ezekiel is 
this, the book of Daniel will give you the timing of everything. The book of Ezekiel will give you events that will actually take place uh, at the second advent. It's more of a tribulation, second coming, millennial book, but it was actually written during that 70-year period as well. Then you get into, um, so Ezra is going to cover almost this whole time period. Let's just go ahead and put um, 33 AD here because I'm going to need that here in a little bit. Obviously the year that Jesus Christ was crucified. So the book of Ezra is going to cover roughly, uh, we'll put it down here in the 450 time frame. Okay, this will be the book of Ezra. The book of Nehemiah is going to be much more specified, and it's going to be around um, 450 to 434. It may be a little, little older, but those are going to be the main events dealing with the book of Nehemiah. Now, what's the book of Ezra all about? The book of Ezra is all about rebuilding the walls and the city. But the book of Nehemiah is all about rebuilding the temple and the gates around the city. See, the gates are the final thing. The wall without the gates is worthless. But in Ezra and Nehemiah, they're, they, they, they get the foundation set, but then the work goes out into beginning to fortify the city. When I talk about the city, I'm not talking about Jerusalem. You've got to understand. I'm talking about the city of David. Those are two different things. Jerusalem is much broader. The city of David is actually where the temple is and where all the sacrifices take place. At the very end, south end of the city of David is Gehenna or Henum. That the modern versions will tell you is hell, Hades. It's, it's not. So, it's it's a much more centralized location. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In, in the order of the books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then you would think Esther, right? But it's not. Esther's back in here um, between 486 and, well, we'll just call it 450. It probably ends a little sooner than that. <clears throat> Actually, I know it does because it only goes 12 years. So we'll put it at 474. <clears throat> There's the book of Esther. It actually happens before Nehemiah and the events of Nehemiah. Now you say, well, what does that prove? Here's what this proves. Ezra, this is what we're going to get into this morning, but Ezra, they go back and they rebuild the city. The book of Esther is all about the Gentile. Vashti is a Gentile bride to Ahasuerus, or Xerxes. And she gets booted off the throne, and Ahasuerus brings in Esther, the, Gen the Jewish maiden. It's a picture of God turning his attention from the Gentile back to the Jew. When does that happen? The rapture of the church. Then... 434 is an extremely important date when it comes to Daniel's 70th week and in, in history and then looking ahead. That's when they finish everything. So Esther happens before all of this happens in Nehemiah. So if, you, if, if God's going to stick to the same chronological scenario, the rapture is going to take place before the temple is, is built or completely finished. So that's, that's my take on it. So that this is what we're going to start. We're going to start this whole thing, and I'm going to take it as slow as I can, and we're going to really dig into the details of everything. And then obviously, most importantly, we're going to show you how what they're doing physically in Esther and Nehemiah and Ezra plays exactly into what you and I do as Christians. How many of you have ever wondered why in the book of Revelation it doesn't just call Jesus Christ the King of Kings? Have you ever wondered that, or have you ever even thought about it? For two seconds. <clears throat> what is it calling? King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What you have there is both kingdoms 
kingdom of heaven. God, as Jesus Christ, is the king of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven has everything to do with Israel. Heaven is a, even though we can't physically go there, but heaven is a place that you can actually go. And it's centered around a physical piece of dirt, Jerusalem, in a physical nation, Israel, with a physical king. And there's a list of them all through the Kings and Chronicles. David, Solomon, Josiah. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's all physical. He's the king of that kingdom. But he's also the Lord of Lords. He's Lord over the church, the kingdom of God. A spiritual kingdom. I say that to say this. In your Bible, these three books is all about the kingdom of heaven. It has nothing to do with the church, doctrinally. It has everything to do with Israel. The Gentiles are still, when, when Ezra starts, the Gentiles are still 500 years away from having any kind of opportunity of having a relationship with God. Almost 600 years away. But understand this. Every single thing in this book, even though it might have a physical application to Israel in the past or maybe in the future, has everything to do with you and I spiritually right now. And so the cool thing about these three books is it ties everything together. It's Old Testament Israel recovering from this 70-year exile in Babylon and how to restore their relationship with God after completely turning their back on Him. But then it also has everything to do with what's going on in Israel right now, and has been for the last 123 years, actually 127 years. But then it has everything to do with how you and I build a relationship with Jesus Christ as a Christian in the church age. And then actually, it gets down, even funnels down this close. I think it has, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I think it has everything to do with what's going on since 2018. And I'll show you that as we get through here. So we got all kinds of stuff to play with with this. This is going to be a good time. <clears throat> I'm excited because it ties the book of Daniel in and all the, all the timing that Daniel gives for everything. Let me start with this. Life in 1896. Anybody have any idea what life was like in 1896? Pro probably much simpler in terms of uh, the pressures of life. Let me give you, I'm going to give you a few scenarios here. In the automotive industry in 1896, the first American gas-powered automobile was designed in 1893. And by 1896, they had sold the first U.S.-made gasoline car in 1896. Very first car. Now look at us. I mean, we're, we're making cars out of electricity. We are very sophisticated. Um, communication. In 1875, Alexander Graham Bell uttered the famous words, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. Demonstrating they can transmit sound over wires. But in 1896, the first rotary dial phone was invented. We haven't made it very far from that. I saw a, um, a little video here not too long ago, and they, it was a mom and dad, and they had a, their, their son and a, his buddy, and they took him to a rotary phone, and they gave him the phone number of a f number they had to dial, and they said, okay, figure out how to do it. Oh, my gosh, it was hilarious. They couldn't figure out, like, okay, wait, maybe we do, and it, it was like three minutes long, and, and they never did figure it out. They had to tell them how to do it. <clears throat> but 1896, they've got your first rotary dial. And I know it's not the same rotary phone as what they had now. But uh, in, in the energy sector, um, in 1896, uh, Westinghouse built the uh, Niagara Power Plant. Only 10 years after the very first commercial alternating current power system was set up. So electricity was just getting off the... Uh, the ground. By the way, the whole telephone thing. Anybody ever find the, the telephone in the Bible? There's a good Bible challenge for you for the week. Uh, let's see. How about mealtime? 
Preparing food was different in 1896 compared to today because you couldn't preserve perishable items with cold uh, refrigeration. That didn't become available in 1915. Um, so everything was dealt with um, salt. And, you know, uh, how many of you ever read that that book series? Um, oh, shoot, what was that girl that... There you go, thank you. You read that book series, and she will talk about how she would go out with her dad going into winter, and they would get all the meat they could, and then they had the whole attic set up to be able to hang the food. And then the stairs to the attic or the cellar, one of the two, they had to keep it dark because on the stairs they would stack all the things the jars and stuff that couldn't have light on them. I mean, it was a really intricate system. Much different than today. No McDonald's to swing through and grab. Why do I bring that up? You know what's always interesting to me, personally? I think about, you know, 1896, and I'm like, wow, that was a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago, in the grand scheme of things. I mean... We talk about Bible time, and we were talking about B.C. stuff. 120 years ago was not that long ago. I mean, my great-grandmother was born just after 1896. I mean, she's only been uh, passed away for a few years. She was 100 and what, Grandma? 103? I mean, we're, we're on the cusp of people that still lived in that time, still being alive right now. It's not that long ago. And yet think how much everything has changed. But see, Daniel said that technology would increase during the, the end of, of civilization. 1896 was an absolute incredible turning point in history. And it really doesn't get talked about. I, I had never heard of this in, in school. And <clears throat> I don't brag about this because it's not that I did great or anything. And I wasn't a historian by any stretch of the imagination. But I completed high school and went to four years of college. Never heard of this event. Anybody know what took place in 1896 that was so significant when it comes to Bible history? And actually where we are right now? There was a gentleman named... Theodore Herzl. And in 1897, he wrote a document that basically began the Zionist movement. He's actually known today or, or uh, referred to today as the father of the Zionist movement. Zion as in Mount Zion, as in the mountain that the temple will be built on in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Theodore Herzl is, in 1896, is the one that began the movement to allow the nation of Israel to have their own land again after almost 2,000 years. See, we say 120 years, that's, that's a long time ago. How about 2,000 years? Israel had been 2,000 years without a homeland until Theodore Herzl wrote a document about allowing the nation of Israel to purchase land in Palestine to begin their establishment of a nation again. And then all of a sudden, in, in 1917, anybody know what 1917 is important for in biblical history? A, na a man by the name of Lord uh, Arthur Belfour stood up in the English Parliament. And this wasn't popular. And he stood up in the English Parliament in 19... I think it was November... Um, what, I wrote down the date somewhere, but November 4th or something like that of 1970. He stood up and he spoke in front of the English Parliament and basically said, we have to help Israel get established again as a nation. Now, it was still another 30 years before almost 30 years before everything was in place to get that done. But those two men alone are men that are so significant in the history of the nation of Israel, recent history of the nation of Israel, to get them to where they are today. Now, spiritually, they're a wreck. But you have to understand, what God is doing is getting everything prepared for His Son. So, 
Why is that important for you and I? Well, obviously we know from a historical perspective. Folks, God is not, if you want to know what's going on in the world, don't look at the church. Other than the fact that you look at the church and say, wow, the church seems like it's a wreck. You say, well, how do you know? The parking lots are full and they're building these mega buildings and people are coming by the thousands and tens of thousands and in some cases by the uh, hundreds of thousands. I mean, why, how, how could you say the church is dead? We've never had a more prosperous time in church history ever when it comes to what we're being able to accomplish through technology and this and that. You know how I know? Turn the news on. Watch it for about five minutes. Were we having school shootings in the 19, early 1900s, in the 1800s? I mean, Dick's not here this morning, but he'll, he'll tell me all the time about, and this was only in the 70s, they would drive to school with the guns from hunting that morning in the, in the gun rack of their back window of their truck and leave them there in the parking lot of school all day, and nobody thought twice about it. I mean, so short a time, we've come so far and not in the right way. Don't look at the church, folks. Look at Israel. Israel is literally the spot. You know, the uh, the center, anybody know where the center for the land mass of the world is located? It's right where the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza is built in Egypt. If you took all the weight of the of the earth and you had to balance it on one point, it would be right there where the Great Pyramid of Giza is at. By the way, that pyramid, if you want to know anything about the structure of the universe, go study that pyramid. It's <laughs> And they built this thing back in like probably Job's time. So, <clears throat> you know where the center point for everything that goes on in this universe is located Mount Zion Jerusalem of Israel it always has it's just that God put it away for a time but if you want to know what's going on in the world don't look at world events don't look at China don't look at Russia don't look at Egypt go find out what's going on in Israel that's God's people that's his land that's that's where it all started and that's where it's all going to end Now, for you and I, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know what God gave Israel in 536? Well, it was really 539, specifically. 536 is when they left. I'll talk about 539 in a minute. You know what God gave Israel in 539 B.C.? You know what God gave Israel in... 1 AD, and then you know what God gave again Israel in 1948 AD? Another chance. You know what God gave you and I at Calvary? Another chance. That's what it is. That's why it's important. That's why everything that goes on in the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther is extremely important for your and I's life because it's all about God restoring Israel and giving them another chance. They became a new nation in 539. They became a new nation in 1948. You and I became a new creature the day you and I got saved. And everything that Israel had to do through Ezra... Nehemiah and Esther on restoring their fellowship and relationship with God is everything that you and I have to do after we choose to be a new creature in Christ. That's why it's important to you and I today. And that's what we're going to spend some time focusing on <clears throat> as we go through here. Uh, start out in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 for a second. Last week we talked about site cleaning. And before you do any type of construction, before you do any type of gardening, before you do almost anything that involves the, the ground, you've got to go out and clean it out. Prep it. What kind of success do you think you'd have if you went out in your front yard when you got home today and dug a couple holes and planted tomatoes or whatever it is just right in the middle of your front yard? Probably not going to have much success. 
because you got to get the ground prepped, you got to loosen the soil, you got to have everything prepared so that those plants can thrive the way they were meant to thrive. Well, the same is true when it comes to our walk with Jesus Christ. In 2 Chronicles chapter tw uh, 34, if I said 34, I feel like I said 24. 2 Chronicles 34, look at verse 1. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty-one years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam. And in his presence and the images that were high above them, he cut them down. And the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode upon the graves of them. Uh, that had sacrificed unto them, and he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And we talked about that several weeks ago, but I wanted to bring it back to our attention because when you site prep, you got to get rid of everything that shouldn't be there. That's what this young man Josiah did when he began to reign. He was the last king that had any decency to him before Nebuchadnezzar came and took everything over. You say, why did he do that? Well, look at verse 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, uh, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of uh, Joaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord, his God. Because he wanted to repair the house of the Lord. And he understood that the only way to repair it was to get rid of all the stuff that shouldn't be there. And the only way you and I are going to begin the process of building is to site prep. Meaning, we got to clear off everything that shouldn't be there. When Ezra and Nehemiah went back, they had to prep the land. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had kind of done that for him because he burned everything out and everything was refreshed, but preparation. Now, look at, uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for a second. What I want to do here, real quick, is show you. Have everything in the Old Testament is simply a picture of a doctrine in the New Testament for you and I as a Christian. Because everything in Ezra is about laying a good, solid foundation for the temple. But before they did that, they had to prep the ground. Now look what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 10 it says according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon but let every man that take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ Now, here's the great thing about the way our salvation works. Our site prepping was all completed at Calvary. All we had to do was accept it. But you have to understand that the moment we accepted Jesus Christ, the foundation was set. So where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves exactly where the nation of Israel in the book of Ezra finds themselves. A foundation. Everything you do from, this, from that day forward is about what you do on that foundation. How you use that foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7, 
It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You say, I don't know how to prep myself. He just told you right there, get rid of the, uh, the leaven. You know what leaven is in the Bible? Sin. Clear it out. Just like Josiah did in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Every single day you and I wake up, you know what we're given? Another chance. I'm not saying another chance as in you didn't do a good job the day before. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is today is a new day. You know what the Bible says about today? Today is the day of salvation. You may already be saved spiritually, but you can still work each day to grow closer to Jesus Christ. You know, you can look at it this way. Today is a new day to save what you missed doing yesterday. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Why? We know not what a day may bring forth. Jesus tells us that we're not to worry about tomorrow's problems. Why? Because those problems will take care of themselves. Focus on what we're supposed to be doing today. That's how you, that's how you, there, there's no way, folks. You know why the world is in a mess that it's in right now? And, I'm, and, and from a mental standpoint, there's just too much to think about. People are overloaded mentally. You can't, you cannot literally comprehend, especially if you've got all these different, you know, Facebooks and Twitters and TikToks. I don't even know all the stuff that's out there. You, the information comes in fast, literally. I'm not, this is not being facetious now. Literally comes in faster than what your brain can comprehend. Not faster than what your brain can see, but faster than what your mind can comprehend. It is literally mental overload. The only way we will be able to cope with the things that are happening in this world is to focus only on what God needs us to do today for Him. Everything else will fall in its place. I promise. I promise. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 21, it says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, the these is the, the vile things that this old life will throw at you, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now, does any, did anybody see the common word between those two last verses, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and this one here in 2 Timothy? Purge. Thank you. Purge. What's purging? Burning things out. Not just setting it aside, not just putting it in a corner. No, you burn it out. You get rid of it completely. Take a step back a few weeks to when we talked about the furnishings of the temple. What did they have to use to make those sacrifices on that altar? Fire. And that fire had to come off the brazen altar. It had to be the fire of God. And those old boys back there that took the strange fire to try to make the sacrifices were killed on the spot. Because they had the wrong fire. You start noticing some similarities through, through the passages of Scripture when you, when you start studying the Bible. And you find out one of those things is fire with God. And yet... We have a bunch of knuckleheads. I, I, I had it on yesterday. I mean, sometimes I just, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. You can't turn on country music because all they talk about is beer and alcohol and sex and drugs. You can't, I, I mean, I don't listen to much other music than that when I try to listen to music. So I think, well, maybe I'll just turn on, you know, the Christian radio station. Just at least it's not, at least the Jesus and God is being mentioned, right? But sometimes I sit there and I listen to some of the, the things that these people say, and I'm like, do you even realize what you're saying? The one song in particular yesterday was the guy that was asking for 
uh, the fire out of heaven to come down on the church for revival. I mean, does that, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you confuse that. When Jesus Christ is here in Matthew chapter 3, he says, I'm going to baptize you with the Spirit and fire. Or water and fire, whatever. Uh, that He's telling you it's going to be one or the other. And do you know where the fire comes from? Fire in the Bible is used for one thing. The fire for God is used for one thing. It's used for purging. It's to purge sin, folks. And where does that fire come from? It comes from hell. Because that's where sins get purged. And you're asking for fire to come down to revive the church. Yeah, you're going to get it. Literally. I... I, I If it wasn't for the rapture, I think a lot of Christians would be in big trouble. Because I think a lot of Christians would take the mark of the beast. I'm not preaching that as doctrinal truth. I'm just, that's my opinion. You know what God says about Israel in the tribulation? This is, see, when you understand, everything runs parallel. God says, unless I shorten the days... Everybody would die. Well, so I think I think we can put the church in there, and I think God says, unless I send my son back to save his bride, everybody would take the mark. Not everybody, but you know what I mean. Second Chronicles 36. I guess I should pray now that I'm halfway through this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your patience and your mercy and your kindness. And Lord, my prayer as we begin this study in the book of Ezra is that we can, it's, it's kind of threefold. One, we see the historical importance and what was going on. Two, we see the current importance and how it plays into what's happening in our world today. And then three, probably most important, is we see how it applies to our life as a Christian. And how you just told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that the moment we get saved, the foundation of Jesus Christ is laid in our life by you. And then it's up to us now to build upon that foundation. God is exactly what Ezra was doing and those, those uh, families back there. Lord, I pray that you uh, help us to see what they were doing there applies to how we are to build our relationship and fellowship with you on a daily basis. At the end of the day, Lord, what we're trying to get out of this is that we are ready to meet you in the air. There'll be no regrets. There'll be no, uh, no things left undone. And that the suitcases are packed and we're ready to board that flight to meet you face to face. Lord, we thank you for all you do for us. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we get into 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and we find ourselves in 606 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar has come in. He's taken captive Israel, moved the rest of the people out. Well, he makes one final move in around 581, but 606 is the bulk. Shennacherib took a small, grim, or a small group in 721, and now Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes the rest of it. So we're going to get into the book of Ezra. I know I jump around a lot, but we just have to. We have to set the stage. Jeremiah chapter 25. Watch this. God tells you everything before he does it. Jeremiah chapter 25. In verse 11. He says, well, let's, let's start in verse 10. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth. That's, that's uh, laughter, amusement and laughter is mirth. And the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the sound of the millstones and the light 
of the candle. By the way, that is a tribulation verse. Who's the light of the candle? Or what is the light of the candle? It's the Holy Spirit. You go over the book of Revelation, the churches are represented by the candles. The Holy Spirit's the light. Guess what's going to be taken out right before the tribulation starts? What did God just tell you he was going to take away? The light of the candle. The Holy Spirit's going out with the church. Verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. Is that not yet future? Because what does Revelation chapter 17 say about Babylon? Mystery Babylon. Babylon's still there. Only look at the last two words of the verse. 70 years. Wait a minute. Tribulation is not 70 years. What is he talking about? What you have here is a dualistic prophecy. You have a prophecy from Jeremiah 25 looking ahead to 70 years when Israel is going to be in Babylon serving the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. But you also have a prophecy that looks ahead 2,500 years to the end of the church age. Now, I know the 70 years won't apply at that particular case, or will it? I'll show you that in a second. But God just told you that Israel, around 750 when Jeremiah was written, that Israel was going to be 70 years serving a king who was not alive at that point, Nebuchadnezzar, in Babylon. He didn't hide anything from them. You know, when, when folks get to the great white throne judgment and they stand there before God and God lays out all the sins that they committed and they have to answer to every one of them and Jesus Christ is sitting at God's right hand uh, and then David's sitting at his right hand and then somewhere we play into that because we'll be judging at the ju great white throne judgment as well. And, and every person that steps up on that throne that you witness to that deny Jesus Christ will see you there. Oh, by the way, also the ones that God told you to witness to and you didn't, and they'll look at you and say, why didn't you tell me? But they'll all be there. And you know what? I have a feeling the number one excuse is going to be, well, I didn't know. I had no idea. Now, don't raise your hand if you don't want to, but how many of you have ever had to stand before a judge in a courtroom? And that judge brings you up there and says, okay, here's your whatever you're in there for. And you look back and say, oh, judge, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was a law. And he says, oh, ma'am or sir, I'm sorry, that, that's our fault for not reading you the uh, one million pages of the law before you, you know, embarked on life's journey, you're free to go. Now, I mean, unless he's, you know, if they're nice, maybe we'll give you a free pass. But by law, that is not an excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse for breaking the law. Well, where do you think our law system gets its structure from? Ignorance is not going to be an excuse for denying his son, Jesus Christ. By the way, all God's going to do is turn to the book of Romans in chapter 1 and say, Hey, buddy, did you ever get up in the morning and look at the sunrise? Did you ever look at the sunset in the evening? Did you ever look at the stars and the moon at night? Did you ever wonder how you can take a little seed that's smaller almost than what you can see and you put it in the ground and three to six months later it produces food? Did you ever wonder how the human body was structured to the point where it could fight off diseases and this? And I mean, God's just going to go on and on and on because in Romans chapter 1 he says, everything I created was, was based after me. And then he put that little phrase in there. I believe it's, is it 28 or 30, 31? So that every man is without excuse. There will be no excuse. <clears throat> but, but, but they'll try. But God told them right here. They had their warning. 
that they were going to be 70 years in captivity if they didn't get their act together. And they didn't get their act together. Now what caused that? Jeremiah chapter 14. What caused Israel to get in the mess they were in? Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth, Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black under the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up, and their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. And they came to the pits and found no water. And they returned with their vessels empty, and they were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth. And the plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yea, the hind also calved in the field and forsook it because there was no grass. And the wild asses did stand in the high places, and they snuffed up the wind uh, like the dragons, and their eyes did fail because there was no grass. And then verse 7 says, O Lord, Though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. You know what the problem was? They turned their back on God. God shut off the rain. He shut off the crop. He shut off the food. They were in sin. Some companion passages go to Isaiah 1, 10 through 17, Amos 5, 22. I won't do it for time's sake this morning, but same premise. You know what their problem was? They were a wreck. God is merciful. Amen. God is long-suffering. Amen. But he can only take so much. He can only take so much, folks. And he'd had enough with Israel. He would gave them warning after warning after warning. Now I went back, just kind of a brief survey. The number, I, and I, I didn't try to structure it this way, it just fell this way. In the Old Testament, Adam, keep these in mind for a second. Noah, Abraham to Joseph. The exile, Joshua through Judges, Solomon to 606, and then Ezra to Malachi. Anybody know the common link between all of those? Let's put it on a let's put it on an economic scale. An exponential fall. Adam started out in a perfect garden with perfect fellowship with everything he needed with God. And by the end of his life, Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, he died. Noah built the ark to survive the animals and his family. By the time his story ends, he's laying drunk in a cave and having an ancestral relationship with his youngest son. Abraham, father of the nation of Israel. By the time Joseph gets to the gets done, in in the last verse in Genesis chapter 50 is Joseph died and was buried in Egypt. And in, in Exodus chapter 1 it says, and there was a new king which knew arose in Egypt which knew not Joseph. And they were down 430 years in Egypt. Joshua, God carries him into the promised land. Across the Jordan River. He said, if you keep my commandments, I will give you everything you need. I will fight your battles. I will wipe out your enemies. I will feed you with milk and honey. You will have no worries if you can keep my commandments. By the end, the judges, for there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Solomon, the greatest king Israel had, built the, the, the most expensive and beautiful structure this world has ever seen in the first temple. By the time we get to 606 B.C., the temple is burned out, stripped out, the land is barren, and all the Israelites are either dead or they've been carried off to Babylon. Starting to see the, the trend? Guess how many, and again, those were the major ones. Guess how many we just covered there in the Old Testament? Seven. Now watch this. The Lord Jesus Christ's birth to the cross. 
Acts chapter 8 to 1500 A.D. By the way, 1500, that's the Dark Ages. That's the end of the Dark Ages. So you start out in Acts chapter 8 with the first man saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in the history of the world. And by the time you get to 1500, Christians have been, been persecuted for a thousand years. 1900 to the rapture of the church. Down, down, down. There's three. Seven in the Old, in the New Testament, uh, Old Testament, three in the New Testament, ten total. Everything's covered by that, by the way. My point is this. Ain't nothing getting better. There were some up peaks in there, don't get me wrong. But then, whoosh, and whoosh. And here we are. And that's where Israel finds himself right now. Now, 606, or let's start in 539. You know what 539 in modern history represent? 1896 with the Zionist movement. Theodore Herzl. What was so significant about what Cyrus did, let's read it, Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you all of his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. King Cyrus, who was prophesied again in Isaiah chapter 41, several years, a hundred years before he was even born, that he would be the one to release Israel out of this captivity. That proclamation went out in 539 B.C. This kicks off Daniel's 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9. We're not going to have time to get into it this morning, but we'll talk about it next week. That's the beginning of Daniel's 70th week right there. Daniel's 70 weeks take you from here to here. Now, they don't in the number of years because Daniel's 70 weeks is only 490 years. That's obviously 572 years. But you know what Daniel's 70 weeks also do? They take us from here to the second advent. That's why Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther is so important along with Daniel. So in 539, you've got Cyrus's proclamation. That'll be Lord uh, Theodore Herzl. By the way, Theodore Herzl is called the father of the Zionist movement. Abraham was called the what? Father of many nations. You know when he was called out? Somewhere right around 2000 B.C. 2000 to 1900, somewhere in that time frame, which puts you... Right where Theodore Herzl was. Then in 1917, you got Lord Belfar. That's going to fit right into that similar time frame between 539 and 536. 536 is specifically going to represent May 14th of 1948. Because on May 14, 1948, the United States with Harry Truman along with, um, I can't remember who was in charge of, of Israel at that particular time, signed the document to allow Israel to be a free nation again. You know how big their, nation, their uh, borders were? Nine miles. Small. But it didn't matter. God had his foothold back in the Middle East again. Not that he ever lost it, but now man could see it. In 536, in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, the first wave of, of Jewish Hebrews go back from Babylon to Jerusalem. And in 1948, Israel became a nation again. <clears throat> 
Now, I told you that the 70 years in Jeremiah wasn't looking ahead to current time. Or was it? What happened in, on May 14th of 2018? Does anybody know? What is it? Thank you. He moved the, the embassy of the United States, who is, if you still want to call it that, the world power at the, for the time being, from Tel Aviv back to Jerusalem. For the first time since ancient time, Israel's capital was restored and put back in place. On the same day, exactly 70 years later from 1948, that Israel became a nation. Exactly 70 years. God tells you everything before he's doing it. So in 539 B.C., in the most recent time, would represent 2018. They're back. Now, I gave you this a few weeks ago, too, but I, I just don't, there's just not coincidences. King Cyrus was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 45. The president that was in charge on May 14th of 2018 was the 45th president. You ever see this? Probably have. Whoa, have you ever seen this thing flip? Okay, so watch this. Think there's any coincidences with God? You think God didn't know the United States of America was going to be the last country in power that was ultimately going to put Israel back in their place and put Jerusalem back in their place? Exactly 70 years after they became, I don't. I I don't think this is a coincidence. Again, I'm not a political man. I'm like uh, uh, Alan Jackson that sang that song after the World Trade Center bombing. He said, I'm not a political man. You know, uh, what was that song? I can't remember the name of it. But there you go. But there's no coincidence with God. My politician is Jesus Christ. He's the only one I'm waiting for to be reinstituted. Was that not the name of the ticket for four years? Somebody say those two names together, please. Trumpets? Really? Out of all the people in the world for 6,000 years, the last two that would be in charge of getting Israel reset right where they need to be for everything to happen is going to spell out trumpets? The one instrument in the Bible that is for two purposes, for the regathering of Israel and for the calling out for war? Come on. You're killing me. Oh, and the Bible just happens to say, now, again, coincidence or not, at the last trump. You don't think God's trying to get people's attention? I'm not saying that God meant that it was going to be the guy, but I think God's trying to help people connect some dots, that you better get yourself where you need to be. You better turn to Ezra and Nehemiah and find out what was going on in those books. You better figure out how to get your relationship with Jesus Christ in place. You better get your foundation cleaned off. You better purge the land, and you better start building, because not very far from now, the old trumpets are going to start blowing. <clears throat> oh, yeah. We're getting close. We're getting close. Now I want to give you seven quick things out of Ezra chapter 1 here that I think we all need to look from what Cyrus did. Cyrus was not a Christian. I mean, there weren't Christians in 606 B.C. or 530. He was not a godly man. He was not a Hebrew. He did not follow the Old Testament law. But you notice if in here a couple times he references the fact that God is the God. And yet God used that man to get everything situated to give Israel 
everything they needed to have. And there's some interesting things in these first couple verses. First of all, it says in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord the purpose of the word was out of the mouth of Jeremiah that might be fulfilled. Let me ask you a question. Is the word of the Lord being fulfilled in you this morning? What are you allowing the word to do in your life? Because here's a man who was not even a follower of God, and yet he was fulfilling the scriptures. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, we get so backwards. I mean, of course we do. The book of Isaiah says that our ways aren't his ways, our thoughts aren't his thoughts. Why would God put verses in there like, Let the word of God dwell in you richly if he wouldn't allow it to dwell in you richly? God wants you and I to have absolutely every blessing and every fruit and every, I don't even know what all he can give because he's just that much bigger. But he wants us all to have it. Sometimes we get this idea that God is out to venge us for our sin or whatever the case might be. or he, No. Richly. In Romans chapter 1, I'm, I'm, I, every one of these I've given a, a good scenario, but I've also put the counter to it because I think it's important that we understand that when the Word of God doesn't dwell in us richly, what the other avenue is. In verse 29 it says, being filled with all, you can be filled and it says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignant, uh, uh, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural effect. Boy, that list is long. Now, it's hard to keep track of all those. Or you can just let this... Well, in you in full. Pretty simple. Number two. I've stuck a bookmark in there. He says that the Lord, uh, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Let me ask you, what's the spirit stirring up in you? There's a great story over there in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. When God sends Ezekiel out to that valley, and he looks down that valley, and it's just a bunch of bones. God says, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to breathe. God, listen. God says, I'm going to breathe through you. And you are going to take my breath and breathe on those bones, the breath of life. And those bones are are going to come alive again and they're going to grow sinew and flesh and they're going to get up and walk around and be alive again. That's where we get that old story of the valley, uh, uh, those bones, those bones, those dry bones. That's where that comes from. And Ezekiel walks out there and he breathes on those. And by the way, that whole passage is a great passage on understanding the inspiration of God. And he goes out there and blows on those old bones, and those things rise up. Doctrinally, it's a picture of Israel becoming a nation again in 1948. But for you and I, it's a picture of the day you and I got saved. And from that moment forward, the Spirit of God is moving. You know the first thing that happened on this earth after it was uh, Lucifer blew it all up? What was the first thing that happened? Genesis 1-2. And the earth was dark and void and without form. And the what? Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God showed up. And that Spirit has been moving since 4004. That same Spirit that came down on this old earth 
and begin to get things back in order is the exact same spirit that's dwelling in you this morning as a believer. And it's the exact same spirit that will guide you into all truth. All the spirit has been trying to do for 6,000 years is get things back in order and get it restored back to God from the mess of the ten scenarios where all mankind has done is just fall and fall and mess it up. And you know what we do? We get mad at God when He tries to move the Spirit through us because it interrupts our program. It's like when they have the rain delay on the golf tournament, you know, and they got to come in and say, due to rain delay, we are going to move you over to uh, Joan Rivers talking about the hand cream, you know. <clears throat> and we get all mad about it. I don't watch golf, so I don't, but I like the hand cream commercial personally. Hey, let the, let the Spirit of God work in you. It's doing it for a purpose. It's purging. It's building. Number three. He says that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. What are you proclaiming in your daily walk? I got two things you could be proclaiming in Luke chapter 14. They were out going up and down the highways and byways proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Christ. And they were trying to gather. Go look at it. Luke chapter 14. Look what God's telling them to do. Uh, 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Want to know the other proclaiming that could be going on? Flip back a page to Luke chapter 12. And look at verse 3. Therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Hey, if we won't proclaim the name of Jesus Christ now, God's going to share to the whole universe what we have been proclaiming in secret. Number four, thus saith Cyrus, verse two, King of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? How far is your message reaching? We talked about the situation with the sins and the trespasses and iniquities going to the third and fourth generation. Hey, how about our proclamation? Is it going to the third and fourth generation? You see, <clears throat> we take a look at society right now and we say, well, it's just always been this way. I mean, since Sodom and Gomorrah, they've been sexual deviants and pedophiles and perverts and sick. I mean, just disgusting filth of people. It's been going on forever. Yeah, but you know what the difference is? <coughs> Excuse me. When God was in charge and God's people were doing what they were doing, all that was suppressed. And the devil didn't have as much pull and as much authority. And, and God was able to keep it in, in, in smaller scenarios, even to the point where he could go into a couple cities and burn it all out and purge it out, and it was done for a while. We look around and say, well, that's just the way people go. That's the way no, it's because the church hasn't done what it's supposed to do in proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to move through people and fill people with the right things. And so the spirit of the Antichrist is able to come out and have his way on this old earth. What's our message reaching? If it was going to the third and fourth generation, then the Gen Z's out here wouldn't be confused if they're boys or girls. They wouldn't be confused what bathroom they're supposed to go in. Number five. He says, His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. He charging them. Go up. 
Let's go. That's the message today. Let's go. You and I don't go anywhere physically. We go spiritually. You know what our whole purpose here as Christians is? We're supposed to fulfill the ministry of Jesus Christ that he started. He came. He preached Christ. He crucified himself. He resurrected. He said, now, you take what I've started and you go finish the work. That's the charge we got. If you go through and read in the book of uh, 1 and 2 Timothy, there are 12 charges that Paul gives to Timothy. Those 12 charges should be implemented in each one of our lives. All right, number six. He says, go up to Jerusalem and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. What are we building? Hey, we're building one of two things in this life. That's it. You're either building treasures on earth or you're building treasures in heaven. We're not going to do it both ways. You say, well, how do I do it? Here's what you do. You give, Lord, give God the first fruits, and then whatever he leaves you left over, you use to do what you need to do in your life. It's, it's that simple. Now, it's much simpler on paper, I know. Whatever God gives you, time, talents, energy, brain power, finances, what? Add it to the list. The list is endless. Whatever he gives you, you give God his first. Did you? We've studied the feast a lot lately. The first feast that Israel, well, the first one was Passover. They had to kill the sacrificial lamb. But for you and I, that's already been done, folks. So the first feast after Passover is what? Remember? The first fruits. Now, did God say, now I want you to go out in the field, and I want you to harvest all of the barley, and I want you to bring it in here to me, and I want you to offer it to the church. Give everything you've got. And then God will bless you a thousandfold on the backside, right? That's how the prosperities work. No, that's not what he did. You know what he said? He said, you go out and you take a, a, a sheave out of that field. One little sheave. And you bring it into me and you heave that thing and you wave that thing and you offer it back to me as a thankful thank, as a thanksgiving for the harvest you're about to have. That's all God asked for. God's not asking for you to just Pour everything you own and everything into, and not have a job and go out and be a martyr and you know drag the cross down the highway. He said, just give me the first of what I'm about to do in your life. You do that every day, and then what you have left, you can have as long as it brings honor and glory to me, you can do what you need to with it. And you know what most people will find out? Because I've heard it. You have told me the stories before. Wow, when I finally figured out, and I can attest to it in my own life. When you get to that point in your life, things just start falling in place. And I don't mean you're not going to have issues along the way. Every April I have issues. Where am I going to pay? No. <clears throat> but... Things just seem to fall in place. What are you building? 2 Corinthians 5.1 and Galatians 2.18. There's your good and bad. We don't have time anymore. Number seven, last one. He says, go build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, in Jerusalem. Let me ask you, where's your work this morning? I don't mean your work like the physical labor. God's not interested in your physical labor. The Bible says all of our works are nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. He doesn't care what these hands can do. He doesn't care what these feet can do. He doesn't care. You know what? I would bet to say almost that some of the greatest Christians are probably people that have physical uh, impalements in life. He's not interested in what you're doing physically. I talk about the work is how you laboring in this. How much is your tongue spoke his name? How much is time have you spent lifting up your prayers? Where's your work? 
The judgment seat for you and I is not going to be what you did or didn't do for God. It's going to be, what did you do with the time I gave you? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I'll close with this. Folks, you got to understand what's getting ready to kick off here in 539 B.C. for the nation of Israel. And you got to realize that the same opportunities that Israel was getting ready to get, you and I have every day that we breathe the breath of life on this earth. When you wake up in the morning, it should be an opportunity to be excited. Lord, use me the way that you need to use me. He says in Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Seventy years they were in bondage. They had to do everything Nebuchadnezzar said. And then finally God gave them a chance, an opportunity to get out under Cyrus. We're out, folks. We're free. Don't be bound by this old world. Don't let the spirit of the Antichrist bind your spirit up, bind your mind up. Be free. Figure out what God needs you to do and jump in. And enjoy the ride. God's going to use you for a great work when you let him, if you haven't yet. And if you have, maybe that's what we got to do someday. Have some of you folks that have truly let God have your life and just come up here and share the testimony. Maybe because there's people in here who aren't fully understand or sure or scared or whatever that how that works or what that looks like. And you just come up here and say, you know what? I was the this, this, this. And then finally, God, did, I, I, I said, God, I'm going to let you have me. And it changed your life. I know it has mine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. God, I know there's been a lot of history and a lot of dates and timelines and a lot of setting up, but Lord, I don't want to miss anything about what's getting ready to take place in these three books because it has everything to do with where we are as a as a society right now, has everything to do with where we are with the nation of Israel right now, and it has everything to do with where we are as Christians right now. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that we would just purge out the ground. The foundation's already been set. Let's make sure that everything is clean and clear and ready. And here's the thing, God, when it comes to the purging, let's make sure that we've got the right fire. Let's make sure we've taken the fire out of the brazen altar to purge and not the strange fire. Because they look a lot alike. They burn the same way. They smell the same. But they're not the same. God, I thank you that you've saved us for a purpose. You didn't just save us and then throw us out here and leave us to figure it out on ourselves like a fish out of water, Lord. You have set a clear, concise path. And you've given us a clear and concise guide and a, con a clear and concise map. Let's band together. Let's go out like in Luke chapter 14 in the highways and hedges and let's bid all to come. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness. Most importantly, we thank you for the sacrifice that allows us all to have fellowship and relationship with you. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.